attendees are in listen only mode. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Q&A session. We will just wait another mo moment before we begin to ensure everyone has logged in successfully. Thank you for joining us for BDO's team in relation to Taranaki business. My name is Brooke Kemsley, I'm from BDO and will be facilitating this webinar channel on your behalf. If you are watching on your phone, you will likely find a question mark at the bottom of your screen if you are on question. To allow our panel to tailor their responses to our audience, we would like you to please answer a couple of basic questions before we get started. Please go to the website menti.com, M-E-N-F-I-N-A-L-E-T-I.com and enter the number 572609 into the box. You can either go to Menti from another device if you have it handy or you can open another tab in your browser. Then flick back to the webinar in your first browser. Just don't close the webinar tab. Please just leave the Menti website open and we'll come back to it in a minute. Now on to today's topic. Joining us today, we have Lisa Cowson and Erin Gall, Associates of BDO Taranaki. They will discuss some of the issues they are currently seeing in relation to the wage subsidy and business continuity. They will also touch on the loan relief for small business scheme that was released late last week. Alex Quinn from ANZ Bank New Plymouth will discuss your financing options and what the bank will need from you to allow them to support you during this time. After these brief introductions on your current issues, we will jump into our Q&A part of today's webinar. Can you now please head back to your menti.com tab and if you haven't already, please answer the first question by entering one or two words describing what industry or type of business you are in. I'll give you a moment to do this. Responses coming range of um, industries covered. You can record a short sentence here. Cash flow, I think that's pretty definitely up there. that are eligible will have applied for and received the subsidy by now. Um, but what we'd like to do is to sort of look at the next step and think about, well, now that you have received, happens. So it's a little bit of a change in focus. Um, you know, thinking about what are the obliga obligations of um, businesses that have received the wage subsidy and what happens if circumstances have changed compared to what was expected when you applied. So just to start off, I will um, briefly go over some background to provide a bit of context in regards to the wage subsidy discussion. So as you'll probably be aware, since the wage subsidy was initially rolled out, there have been some variations to both the wage subsidy and actually the leave support payments that were announced at the same time. And that's been in response to changing needs as the um, government has recognised as we've moved through the different alert levels and through lockdown and then coming back out at alert level three, there was another change. So it's really important to understand the declaration made at the time and for the payment that you've actually applied for. You'll be aware that the wage subsidy application is based on having a drop in revenue. That's one of the criteria for eligibility. And that revenue drop was based on an actual or predicted drop of 30% or more in a one month period. 
The eligibility criteria also included um, an undertaking to make best efforts to pay your staff 80% of their normal wages for those staff you receive a wage subsidy for. And for applications made after 4pm on the 27th of March, there was an express um, requirement within the declaration to retain staff for the subsidy period. Along with those things, there's also a requirement to take active steps to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. So um, there wasn't a lot of detail provided around that. However, it, it would be things like reducing outgoings, which we can imagine businesses have been and, and will continue to do. It would be looking at drawing on existing banking facilities, perhaps using um, cash reserves, seeking funding from owners or certainly um, not making distributions to owners. Um, perhaps the business has surplus assets that it could sell, um, maybe not practical during the lockdown period, but as part of the overall plan. And some businesses may have found that they had insurance policies that they could claim on as well. So those are the types of things that a business owner would be um, expected to do as part of the declaration that they made when applying for the wage subsidy. And obviously the last five, six weeks, um, you know, we've moved on since people applied for the wage subsidy. Now that we've come out of the lockdown period, some businesses are able to operate under Alert Level 3 um, and have a, maybe a better understanding of the overall impact that COVID-19 is going to have on the business. Um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty and even thinking about what business looks like at Alert Level 2 and Alert Level 1, which we haven't actually had really too much detail on, uh, there is still going to be obviously a recovery period and you know, certainly trading and operating won't get back to normal for some time yet for a lot of businesses. So thinking about what we do know now, um, maybe business circumstances are a little bit different to what you anticipated, um, for better or for worse. And perhaps you've had staff movements that you didn't anticipate as well during the last few weeks. Um, you might have started to see reports in the media about subsidy applications being reviewed. And certainly there's been some um, you know, examples provided and, and some strong opinions uh, voiced against certain companies that have uh, received the wage subsidy as well. So with all this in mind, we do expect some business owners are now starting to sort of ask themselves the question, well, have I done the right thing? Am I going to have to repay this? Um, and unfortunately, the answer is going to be different for every business. Um, but we can at least provide some guidelines and a bit of a thought process if this is if that's you and you're sort of starting to think about that, we can give you an, an outline of what to think about in order to determine whether there is a requirement or a possible requirement for you to need to repay some of the subsidy. So the first step would be to think back to the eligibility criteria that I was talking about before and have a really good understanding of what declaration you made and what was contained in that declaration. Basically, once you've done that and worked through the revenue drop, think back and reflect on how you've managed to pay your staff. Think back about the other um, steps that you might have taken over the last few weeks and are planning to take into the future. Really, the key things for you to do now is to understand those things that you've done, record the steps that you've taken, and document some sort of process around how and why you apply for the wage subsidy and how you meet the eligibility criteria and any changes to the circumstances that you might like to record as well. Um, we suggest obviously keep honouring the commitment that you made to your employees as far as possible and we know that that's not always practical. Um, there are businesses that despite best intentions to pay 80% may find themselves in a position where they can no longer pay 80% or perhaps they haven't been able to from the outset. As long as you're passing on the value of the wage subsidy or at least paying people what they earned previously if they didn't earn the amount of the wage subsidy, then that's acceptable, that's fine. Um, ultimately, just be prepared, have in your mind an understanding 
and be comfortable with your situation and being able to explain it and how your business has been impacted in case you do receive a call to discuss your application. Um, anecdotally, we know that that's happening out there and we've actually received some pretty um, good feedback, positive feedback in the way that those calls have been conducted. Um, so I guess the, the message is that if you if your application was made in good faith and was genuine and you're comfortable that you've met the eligibility criteria um, and that you continue to do so, then definitely, um, you know, you're best to focus your energy now on how you're going to reopen, um, understanding your financial situation and your plan for moving forward. Um, because just, just to give a bit of context around the wage subsidy applications, um, I was reading yesterday that out of 2,435 audits and 292 allegations of wrongdoing, only 56 have resulted in um, a requirement to repay the application. So it's a really small percentage, just over 2%. Um, and I think that just shows, um, based on that sample, that there is an authentic and, and genuine use of the wage subsidy. So just keeping the media reports in perspective, I suppose, is my message there. However, in saying that, if you do find that your circumstances have changed, if you do um, look back and see that a predicted drop in revenue hasn't occurred, or if you have had staff move on, then our advice to you is definitely get in contact with MSD. They do have a dedicated um, contact um, email for queries about repaying the wage subsidy. And that's not to say that you will need to repay it, um, but you are required to declare a change in circumstances and provide information around that. And then that just gives MSD a starting point to be able to say, okay, these guys have come to us in good faith they're declaring a change, they may ask for some more information or they may just reply based on what you've said. Um, but I just think in general, just um, better to be upfront and, and forward thinking with those sorts of things where you can. So onto a little bit of um, practical advice around how you actually deal with the wage subsidy in your accounts. The most important thing is to say that the wage subsidy is not subject to GST. So if you're currently preparing a GST return in which your wage subsidy was included in the period, please just ensure that you're not paying GST on this amount. Um, in terms of the taxation of the wage subsidy, uh, as a general sort of easy to remember rule, the wage subsidy will be taxable to an individual in some way, shape or form. So if you think about employees that you pay through your payroll, they are paying tax um, based on their normal employer deductions that you would normally take. If you're a self-employed person and you've received the wage subsidy, you will need to include the wage subsidy in your personal income tax return and there will be tax payable on that. And for shareholder employees who might have received the wage subsidy, again, you will need to declare the wage subsidy as an earning in your own personal tax return and there will be tax payable. So that's that's going to be most for most people in the 2021 year. There may be a small amount that's attributable to 2020, um, but we can certainly advise on that and we will make sure that we are treating that correctly in terms of income tax for you. So that's probably um, in terms of where we're at and perhaps some of the questions that you might be pondering in your own mind, a bit of an introduction. And we are going to be happy to take questions. So please, if there is something that you'd like me to expand on or a, situ a situation that you're not sure about, um, feel free to ask the question once we've um, heard from Erin and from Alex. And for now, I would like to pass you over to Erin, a colleague of mine, associate at BDO, and she's going to talk about business continuity. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, I am going to cover off quite generally on what you should consider. Sorry everyone, just a microphone issue. Um, so I'm going to cover off generally on what you should consider in terms of business continuity, 
finance and cash flow funding and what funds are available to businesses to access support services so we can assist you during this time. So we're currently now at about the halfway point of level three and where is your business at? You may still not be able to operate or at the, operating at a decreased capacity. Looking to level two and beyond, have you planned for all of the different alert levels, the slow economy, how does the rest of this year and next year look for you? Try and plan for change and don't make panic decisions. From an operational perspective, you need to consider how things will operate in reality and ensure you're meeting the relevant health and safety requirements to ensure your business, staff, customers and suppliers are protected and that you're operating within the government guidelines to keep everyone safe. Ensure that you're communicating your plans to all related parties, especially your employees. They might be really anxious about what is going on, so reassurance that you have a plan is important. And unfortunately, we do know that there are some businesses that won't make it through this time. If this might be you, then maybe look for opportunities to sell assets or part of the business to repay debts and maximise what you can get out of the business. We know during the lockdown, everyone will have been looking very closely at costs and trying to preserve cash, and this should still be ongoing. Make sure you're looking at each line item in your P&L and minimising or eliminating all non-essential costs where possible. If you haven't already, it's a good idea to discuss terms with your landlords and with creditors to see if you can get payments spread out to ease um, the shortfall at the moment. There's a, and a need to keep cash flowing for everyone. Talk to your bank about extending any existing funding available and about the business finance guarantee scheme available, which Alex will cover off on after um, I've finished here. In terms of tax payments, and this is one thing that someone um, put into the Menti survey, so IRD is allowing for remission of interest and penalties if a business is unable to pay taxes due to the impacts of COVID-19. You need to let IRD know now, and this is a new scheme, so we're not sure exactly how it um, works out. We know that the interest and penalties aren't likely to be remitted until the debt is paid. So that is still um, something we will be finding out more on as things develop. And alternatively, you can also look to use tax pooling at a later date to meet your obligations. So for anyone that isn't familiar with tax pooling, um, this is a facility where you can kind of buy tax back at the date that you needed it, but it is a lower interest cost than what it would be if you paid IRD late and you were charged interest and penalties. And also likely um, cheaper than if you were to extend a bank overdraft facility and the rate you would be charged there. One important thing to note with the tax payments is that you need to keep paying POAE and withholding taxes. These are held on behalf of with other taxpayers and it's really important that you keep up with meeting these liabilities. So if this is um, likely to be an issue for you, talk to us now so we can look at your circumstances and make a plan to make these, meet these liabilities. Following on from preserving your um, outgoings, in terms of income now, how are you keeping this coming in? It's a good idea to contact your customers and plan for work, discussing payment terms and the flow on effects in your production pipelines that might be occurring if there's delays from your suppliers as everything and everyone gears up and gets back into our new normal. Alternatively, can you use this as an opportunity to try something different in your business? What other ways can you provide your good, goods or service? There has been some great reinvention see during this time, which has been driven by the need um, for people to change. Once you have considered what your ins and outs are likely to be, it's a good idea to put this into a plan and prepare cash flow projections to assist you in decision making. Use your business advisor to bounce ideas, talk through your thoughts and to assist with preparing your plans and cash flows. Considering the things we've, um, I've mentioned above, also take into account what the next three, six, 
12 and 24 months look like? You might want to try different scenarios, so looking at no income for a certain period of time or a slower staggered sales return. If you're preparing a projection for the bank, you might want to discuss expectations with them to ensure that they're aligned as you may have different perceptions on how fast your business, the industry and economy will recover. So if you're at the same, same page from the start, it should help to simplify the process. And make sure your assumptions are really clear. And if it is for the bank, they know exactly um, what kind of decision process you've gone through and how you've got to these certain figures. It's important once you've got those projections in place that you're reporting against them going forward and that you're reviewing and revisiting as things change. Look at the numbers and try and understand what they're telling you. What do you need to do to keep your business going? Talk to us if you don't already have reporting set up because we can help get this in place and make it really simple for you um, to check in and see how things are going on a monthly or um, more frequent basis if needed. We also have um, had the Small Business Cash Flow Loan Scheme announced by the government last Friday. Full details are still to be released, but what we do know is that this is going to be administered by Inland Revenue and people will be able to apply from the 12th of May, and you'll do this from within your My IR account. Eligible businesses are those that have 50 or fewer full-time equivalents, and you can get $10,000 plus $1,800 for every full-time equivalent you employ, up to a maximum of $100,000. This will be interest-free if paid back within a year, and interest will be charged at 3% for a maximum of five years when the loan must be repaid. You do need to declare that you are a viable business and you need to use the funds for core business operating costs. We don't need to know what a viable business is and I'm sure this will be released with the more information that comes out. We will be letting clients know when we have the full details and you can contact us uh, to find out more and see if your business might be eligible. So now that you know what you need to do or should be doing, how are you going to do that? Um, Venture Taranaki has some fully funded support available for businesses so that they can access professional advice. And there's two funds that may be available. So there is a professional services grant where you can get up to $800 of fully funded services. So the Taranaki Regional Councils and Venture Taranaki are contributing the first $400 and then professional firms like BDO are contributing $400 of time to support businesses at this time. To be eligible, you must be a Taranaki business affected by COVID-19 and have 50 or fewer staff. You could use this fund um, for us to assist you with answering questions that you may have on the wage subsidy or changes in your circumstances, business continuity, looking at your short-term cash flow and assisting with decision-making. There's also up to $2,000 available through the Regional Business Partner Network, which um, is administered by Venture Taranaki here. Again, you must be affected by COVID-19, have fewer than 100 staff, be GST registered in New Zealand and operating in a commercial environment. These funds could contribute to us helping you prepare a full three-way integrated cash flow projection and business plan that you might need to put forward to your bank. So if you'd like to find out more about the grants, then please um, contact us or you can head to the Venture Taranaki website, which is listed on the slide there to apply. Um, I'll now pass over to Alex Quinn from ANZ, who will go further into how to work with your bank at this time and look forward to any Q&As that come through after Alex. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my bubble. Um, I hope the first week of your trading under 
under level three went well and you've had a chance to make any any tweaks if required. Uh, thanks to BDO for inviting me along today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Taranaki business community's resilience during this unprecedented situation. Um, you know, everybody's really modelled the, the kia kaha sort of attitude. Um, but I'd also like to encourage you to remain vigilant from a business perspective. Um, there'll be more headwinds uh, and, and challenges to face. Um, you know, and, and to face these, these challenges that might pop up, you know, I really want to encourage uh, you to have a plan, um, monitor your performance and be agile. Have the capability to make changes quickly and uh, communicate regularly with your circle of advisors. Um, I'll be talking about two things today, uh, the BFG um, and other banking options that are out there. So the Business Finance Guarantee Scheme, or BFG as, as most people are calling it. Um, it's, uh, well, like Raudal's character, um, the scheme is big. Um, New Zealand banks are very well capitalised, uh, very safe and, and have money to lend. You know, we're, we're lucky we're in a country where our finance system is, is so strong at the moment. Um, unlike uh, Raul Dahl's character, unfortunately the scheme is not very friendly. Um, the parameters imposed by the government uh, make the application task seem big. So this is where I hope I can help. Um, you know, the key point to the BFG is you know, break it down into chunks. And, and by the way, you know, I think you should do this process uh, you know, like like Erin was talking about, I think you should do this process regardless of whether you're applying for the BFG. Um, so the first thing to do is read and understand the criteria on NB's website. Uh, the key ones that I've pulled out are the turnover threshold. You know, you covered from two hundred fifty thousand up to eighty million. Um, you can borrow half a million dollars to support your business through COVID nineteen related issues. Uh, the money is for cash flow and business operating expenses like rent and staff. Um, it's not for paying out dividends. Um, there are loads of exclusions, uh, but the most relevant ones for Taranaki businesses, uh, you know, it can't be used for property development or property investment. Um, one of the ones that made me laugh was, you know, I don't think there's any Taranaki businesses who are selling whale meat. Um, so whale, selling whale meat is an exclusion. The other big one is it must be paid or repaid in three years. Your business must be able to show that it can support this new level of debt. And, and here's a bit of a tip. If your business could not support this level of additional lending prior to COVID, then it's very unlikely that the funding through BFG will be approved. When the government audits the banks, and they will audit the banks, uh, they will look at this specific point. Why did we lend to this business if they couldn't afford the debt prior to COVID? So it's a key point to think about. Uh, the final one is the scheme's open until the 30th of September. So don't panic. Take your time to get it right. So what does the, the government say you need to provide uh, the bank? You need to provide us with your year-end financial statements for year-end 19, so your complete financial statements for year-end 19, uh, your year-to-date management accounts to financial year-end and year-end 20, and your current debtors and creditor listings. So have a chat with your accountant about getting those together. And where to start? Um, the, key, the key elements really the business plan, um, and this is not a traditional business plan, uh, rather a plan of what you expect the business will do over the next three, six, 12 and 24 months, you know, like, like Aaron said. Um, the plan will house your assumptions that will then build into your 24 month cash flow. So for, for example, I would start with a simple comparison table that shows the three most recent financial periods. So year end 18, 19, and year end 20. It might detail you know, in, in the chart, um, you know, revenue, gross profit, gross profit margin, 
your operating expenses, uh, your operating expense margin, your top five expenses, um, and your EBITDA, your earnings before interest tax and depreciation. So with, with this table together, what you've described is what your normal looks like. And you'll be able to use it as a stencil to redraw what your new normal will look like. So you might describe what your next three months look like. You might have a view that revenue is going to be 30% of normal, but you can only lower your expenses to 60% of normal because of things like fixed costs, for, for example, your rent. So describe in bullet points how you've lowered your expenses to 60% of normal. So for example, you know, I've negotiated to lower my rent for the next three months. Um, you know, I've rearranged the staff roster to lower wage expense. Uh, my purchases are less due to expected lower sales. So put these bullet points in there around how you've, how you've lowered your expenses. So then go on and do that for six months and then go wider, do it for 12 months, and then do a broad overview from that 12 month point out to your 24 month point. And, and you might have a view that you'll be back to 80 to 90% of your normal revenue within 12 to 18 months. So ha have a play like Aaron was talking about, you know, with different scenarios of where, where you think you'll be compared to your normal. So then we get to the execution part. So take your plan and present it to your accountant at, at BDO. Work with them to refine it and convert it to a cash flow forecast uh, that starts with your opening bank balance on the 1st of April 2020. Once you've built that cash flow forecast, now go back into your plan and describe how you'll uh, fund any cash holes that have appeared in the forecast. So this could include the BFG funding. You might say that this funding will cover your overdue creditors that may have accrued while your business has been closed. Um, and it may assist you with the first three months of operational costs. So that, that could be a funding source. Another might be introducing cash from the shareholders of the business or other, other outside sources you may have access to. Um, or you might look at reducing your existing stock holding. You, you may be sitting on some beautiful stock that you can lower to, to create some cash in your business. So once you've done your plan, you've sat down with BDO and figured out the cash flow forecast, looked at what your holes will be, your cash holes will be, and how you might want to plug them, then present that final product to your bank manager as an application for, for BFG. Uh, funding. So ju just to take you back to my first point, um, look, you know, we, we think you should be doing this regardless of whether you're applying for BFG. You know, review it weekly, make tweaks if you need to, be prepared to make hard calls if your situation deteriorates, or, or equally, you know, be prepared to act quickly to scale things up if things are looking better than you expected, you know, have open lines of um, communication with your suppliers. And, and look, most importantly, keep communicating. Keep your bank manager, your accountant, and most importantly, your staff in the loop. Let them know what's going on in your business and how you're thinking. So in, in terms of, of other bank support, um, what, what we did immediately uh, was we enabled customers to tap into things like interest only on your existing business debt of up to six months, uh, temporary overdraft facilities for up to six months, um, deferred or interest only or term extensions on your home loans. Um, we've had a lot of take up in that area. Um, these these options, you know, might be your complete solution. You know, they may help you get through to that point where you're trading back to close to normal. Or those other bank options, you know, might just be your bridge to get you through to a BFG application. So think about how you can best use these um, these options to 
to suit your business. Uh, I'll hand you back to, to Brooke. Thanks, Thanks. Alex, and um, Erin and Lisa as well. I'll ask Erin, Lisa and Alex to all join us. Please turn on your mics and your videos while we jump into the Q&A session. Oh, sorry, Erin. Okay, and just a reminder that you can bring in your questions raise your questions by hitting the orange arrow and, and typing it into the box. So to get us started, um, I think this one's for you, Lisa. Uh, we're back at work now. I have three people that work for me. Two of them have come back to work, but one of them has said that they can't come back because she has kids at home to look after. Do I have to pay her? Um, good question, and I think lots of people will be in that situation um, at the moment. As we know, um, not many children are back at school or early childhood um, centres at this stage. And I think even looking around our team, you know, there are a lot of um, situations now where there's, there has perhaps been two parents at home, and that's now at one, where one's gone back to work. So. Um, that, yeah, probably quite common. I, I think the thing we need to go back to is um, if the business is operational, if there is an expectation that um, a person would resume their normal duties and they're unable to do that due to other commitments, um, I would suggest talking to that person about taking annual leave. I think that's an appropriate um, you know, solution to, to this current scenario. Um, hopefully it will be short term. And if they don't have annual leave entitlement owed, you might consider advancing some annual leave. At this point, um, it's I would suggest not a not a business expense in terms of paying wages out for somebody that um, you know is is unable to work only because of their own personal circumstances. Um, it would be different if they were vulnerable and perhaps accessing a leave support payment, but in this case. Um, due to it being for family reasons, I'd suggest annual leave's probably the best option there to talk through with them. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, and staying with you, uh, just a question about some of the public holidays. Having received the wage subsidy and paying staff 80% of their wages when they are working, what should we have paid mm -hmm. staff on the three public holidays in this period? Yeah, because we did, didn't we? We had Easter and we had Anzac Day. Um, look, I'm not a payroll expert. However, I can point you to video.nz um, COVID-19 support page. We've got some frequently asked questions there. And I do know that there is a specific, um, some specific guidance around what to pay employees through that period. And if you want to even contact Brooke um, and identify yourself, I'm happy to forward that to you after the webinar. Thank you, Lisa. Um, this one's for you, Alex. What does ANZ think will happen if the Reserve Bank cuts the official cash rate to a negative interest rate? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, you know, negative interest rates, uh, you know, negative OCR is, is more effective um, when businesses have an appetite to borrow to expand. Um, but banks are still reluctant to lend. Uh, businesses are definitely not coming to us at the moment to expand. Um, but they may do in the future, you know, as we discover new ways of working, you know, and what the new normal looks like, new opportunities may come out of this. Um, so also ANZ's opinion is that the financial system isn't ready for it now, but we wouldn't rule out negative interest rates somewhere down the track. Um, but for now, you know, we think that quantitative easing is the best tool for the job to get us through this part of the of the situation. Thank you. And also, what's your view on the government's um, SME loan? Yeah. <laughs> um, go back to what you said earlier, Brooke. Uh, no quotes here, please. Um, I'll try and not be too frustrated. But look, but this is what we wanted from the start. This is what the banks wanted from the start was something along this lines, along this line, um, you know, with little conditions around it, sort of easy access based around some metric like FTE, like they've done. Um, but their first stab at it, uh, you know, was 
was the BFG, um, and and that's what's there now to use. So look, we're, look like you know, Lisa was saying. Uh, sorry, Aaron was saying. You know, we haven't seen the, the full conditions of it yet, um, but it just might be another nice tool that you've got in your belt that you can use. Um, to help you get to a point where you can get a BFG loan application underway, where you have access to a larger pool of funds to help your business out. So yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, we're a little angry about it, but <laughs> what do you do? It's politics. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, here's one probably for Erin and Alex. I've calculated my cash flow forecast as best I can for the next two years. I don't have currently have any lending in it, but it doesn't look good. And my turnover is too low to apply for the BFG. Um, I don't know what to do now. Where do I go? Fiona, I suppose um, I would say probably start talking to your bank about what access to existing facilities are available and the um, small business cash flow loan will, would be a good start if you do think you will be able to meet that criteria of being in a viable business. Your thoughts, Alex? Yeah, yeah, you know, sit down and think, you know, <laughs> is taking on more debt the right thing to do for your business? You know, that's the key to any any thought process that you do, you know, whether you're applying for the BFG or, or other options, you know, sh should we be taking this on? Um, and yeah, Talk, talk to your bank. Um, there are options out there, uh, you know, especially our short-term options, which are quite easy to access, that may just bridge you through, you know, the next three to six months where the initial piece of the pain is, is being felt and where you're trying to devise, you know, that plan that's going to see you through, you know, to 24 months, 36 and on. Okay, thank you both. Uh, one for you, Lisa. I'm Confused about what other steps should I should have taken before applying for the wage subsidy. If I still have cash in the bank, does this mean I will have to re repay the subsidy? Um, yes, so there's been little guidance around what the other steps actually means and it's in itself is quite subjective, I think. Um, purely that you have cash in the bank, uh, I don't think would say you shouldn't apply for the wage subsidy. It's probably more around being able to um, explain what the cash in the bank will be used for over the period of time. So wages are obviously only one expense for a business. And in a lot of situations, if, if businesses do have cash reserves, then they will be needed for other payments um, to other creditors and perhaps um, landlord or, you know, there are other obligations that need to be met in addition to wages, obviously. So I think it comes back to understanding your financial situation, to having a plan and being able to um, show what your expected cash in and out is over the next few months and show how those cash reserves, you know, would be used and, and are required to be used to meet other obligations. Okay. So I think yeah. that's probably the first step in answering that one. Okay, um, and following on with you, Lisa, is is it too late to apply for the wage subsidy? No, no, not too late. I understand applications close at the start of June, um, so you've still got a couple of weeks. And a lot of um, businesses, as I said at the start, we expect will have applied, but um, you know there will be other businesses that were unsure of whether they would meet the criteria and prudently have decided to wait and, and assess the impact on their business and that's absolutely um, justified. So if you do want to apply for the wage subsidy you still can and um, you can do that um, through online, it's an easy application um, but if you would like any guidance or any further assistance around that please let me know. Thank you. Um, Alex back to you. What sort of concessions are we seeing from landlords around lease arrangements? What do you think is fair in this space? Yeah, that, that is a, a really hard one. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of people are, are facing into that headwind. Um, look, I'd, I'd just do a Jacinda here and, and go, hey, let's be kind. You know, think about how we can help our tenants. Um, you know, we all need to work together to get through this. Um, speak to your lawyer, 
you know, understand actually what are my obligations within my lease that I have to meet. Um, it may be, you know, under the uh, Law Society um, version six, I think it is, you know, there are provisions in there that, that mean that you have to come back to the table to, to work through to a positive solution. But yeah, just start being kind, you know, start with being kind, be thoughtful, you know, and, and try and work with your tenant. You know, look, you want them to be your tenant in the next, you know, 12, 24, 36 months as well. You know, you want to have a continued great relationship. Great, thanks Alex. Erin, um, one for you. How do I complete a business continuity plan or cash flow forecast, forecast Sorry, if I have absolutely no idea what my, my business is going to look like for the next six months, let alone two years? Yeah, that is um, something we were talking about earlier. For a lot of people, they can, you know, struggle to, on a when we're trading normally, to kind of forecast how things are going to look. So now we're in this unprecedented situation so much harder. So I think as I um, mentioned, trying some different scenarios in your projections and how they look or looking towards some um, of the economic guidance and commentary that is around like uh, Venture Taranaki and the New Plymouth District Council released a report, I think it was just last week um, kind of explaining their expectations for our economy over the next little while. So looking at some of those things and perhaps bouncing ideas off and chatting with your accountant or business advisor just to find somewhere that you, you are comfortable with and that is realistic, I think, is a good start. Okay, thank you, Erin. Um, that brings us to the end of the questions that have come in. So um, we'll wrap up there. Thank you, Lisa, Erin and Alex, um, and to our um, attendees. If you have any specific questions that haven't been answered today, the email addresses of our speakers are on the screen at the moment, so please contact them to directly if you have any questions, if not your, um, your current accountant or advisor. Um, and thank you all for your time today. I hope you found it useful. Uh, as you leave the webinar, you will immediately receive a short survey. Um, we would appreciate your feedback. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.